Your work to do with scientific fact and the strong programme. Could you explain what is a scientific fact? No. <laughs> that is the whole argument. Uh, uh, if there are any, which I doubt, um, then verbal explanation always fails to capture the whole of them. So they change over time because there's this wiggle room between uh, what the words say and what you can take them to mean. And over time, that little bit of wiggle room can become very large. Um, so if you look at, as I have, at facts over a long lifetime in two different areas, they both go the same way. Um, science uh, produces things people reckon to be facts. I, re I reckon the half-life is a few years, which is, you know, it's not bad compared with, say, a Trump tweet, which is a creature of a day. <laughs> and, um, big contrast. But uh, if you would think of facts as eternal verities or anything like that, no, they don't. Does that mean, though, that they have, if they have a half-life, they are facts for a certain amount of time? Uh, some collective or other takes them that way for that time. Um, what do you mean by uh, facts in an absolute sense is beyond me. I mean, a Platonist would have to be interviewed to tell, the, tell you, or a, a mathematician who lives in Numberland somewhere. Um, but if you do it from the point of view of an empirical science, um, there's, there's no satisfactory answer. No. Is there still a sort of meaning behind any scientific endeavour then? Yes. And what are we aiming for then? Intersubjective agreement. And what is an intersubjective agreement? It's where people who have to get along with each other bang around and meet each other, um, agree to call these things facts, um, or used to agree to call these things facts. I'm not sure they do anymore, actually, but uh, agree to call these things facts. Yeah, and that's, an, uh, that's the usual way people think about it. There is another way. You can think of them as the things in the world that make what you believe about the world factual beliefs or factually beliefs beliefs, um, but uh, that's probably the minority vision these days, although it used to be very important when science was professionalizing. Um, and of course these days, I mean, ask yourself this, if you work with a model, um, you're not working with any facts, are you? Or else it wouldn't be a model, would it? Um, and loads of people do these days, right from physics through to biology, um, you name it. Uh, people use models. Uh, so that's one Would you way be able to expand it. on that? What does it, why do you think that working from a model, you're not working from facts in any way? Well, because um, how do you know the model's a, a model of something? And if you haven't got access to the something, then it could turn out to be quite wrong at any minute. Um, and people recognize anyway that, you know, that the uh, model boat whizzing around on the lake isn't a model of whatever it is, ever, any more than the model of the racing car that kids like to use is a model. Um, so, and then, you know, there's same with theory, you know, the detective stories, the detective has a theory and um, it, uh, you give up the idea of a theory at the end uh, and say, you know, you got the culprit, there is the fact of the matter. Um, but the theory and a the model are really very closely related things um, and you can see that in the sciences, you know, the talk of models and talk of theories very overlaps massively. Um, and we always, if we expect a fact, we expect something at the end of the detective story. We've got to remember that's fiction. 
So, um, so that's where we're at. So is there any way of saying that a theory or model is better than one or the other? Well, people do do that. Um, and people argue about that. Uh, I think you've got a session on the Higgs boson in the um, festival. Um, and people are getting worried because the Higgs boson isn't behaving itself. Uh, so, it, um, other, other theorists are saying we perhaps ought to go in another direction at this point, and they're having a, a lovely argument uh, about what the status of this boson is, and so on and so forth. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just the same in biology. I, you know, people study you via a rat model, what do you make of that? You think you're just like the model. <laughs> So what causes then the half-life in which they sort of die out different theories and models or facts from these? Well, it's partly accidental. I mean, you don't know in advance. If you think you've got, discovered something and then you say you've got a fact about it or, you know, whatever you say, um, you don't know in advance how long it's going to last <laughs> as, as a matter of shared agreement. Um, a lot of it's luck. Um, the, you know, the, <clears throat> the guy who observed the satellites of Uranus identified seven of them, and there's only three of them left. <laughs> the others have been discarded as artifacts or accidents of some sort, or uh, errors of observation or whatever. And that's, you know, I mean, that's quite a vivid example. It's easy to understand, but in the levels of Fancy theory, it's just the same. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, perhaps some of them will last so long, you know, that after a bit we'll call them the truth or whatever. Um, it's probably just at that point that they'll die out. That's what happened with classical physics. It was just when it decided it was complete and a work of beauty and genius that it completely collapsed. <laughs> so, uh, who knows? You never know. And you talked about before the fact that language could never, there was always error in language in describing the world. Does that mean that you think that uh, language itself can't be relied on to describe the world and that there still is an objective reality, we just can't describe it with language? Or do you just think there is no objective reality in which there is to describe? My, my personal view would be quite close to what you've just said. I, I think there's something out there. Uh, it might be, you know, I mean, there are people around who are saying it's, uh, the whole world's an illusion. Uh, so, uh, how do I show they're wrong? <laughs> because if we're all deluded, nobody's got the standing to show illusion exists anywhere. Um, but my personal habits incline me to think there's something out there, and when I open my eyes in the morning, I get in contact with it. Um, but the problem, there is, as you say, there's a problem talking about it or even pointing to it. You know, I, I talk about a bit of the world and there's always something um, like a kind of lack of fit, although it, it's not really a lack of fit because you don't know the really, except through the, either the model or whatever. Same with if you point to something. You know, I, I point to you. How do you know I'm not pointing at the camera over there or at a bit of you? Right? And how do you know how to follow the line of my crooked finger? Um, it's indefinite. And that's the direct observation of fact wobbling around. It's indefinite. So if everything's indefinite, um, that little bit of wobbling around can get very much worse over time as more and more people use the words. Um, and at some point it goes pop. <laughs> people think they start somewhere else. <laughs> Could you argue though that over time it leads to more precision rather than it leads to more it, probabilities? What's it? Uh, a theory or a model or a fact? You were saying that over time it becomes, it there's does a bigger it, gap in well, the... Definitely what it does is get people together. And as they get together and share, by 
agreeing that that and that's a matter of fact, and therefore they, you're not allowed to change them for a bit, <laughs> as it were. Um, you get them to interact, and shared knowledge grows at a much more rapid rate than um, fantasy knowledge or whatever individual knowledge, which is a contradiction in terms. Um, so it, it, it does, it is helpful. Uh, but the, it's rather like driving on the left helps. <laughs> you live longer, you know, so forth. Um, and I'm, I'm all for this sort of stuff, and I'm part of, uh, part of communities where I quite happily talk about what's out there and work in agreement with them. And they tell me things, and I go, dude, you found that out, you know? And I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, a lot of people seem to be incapable of being happy with things that isn't going to last, aren't going to last forever. Uh, I suppose they think it's like death, you know, you should be worried about it. <laughs> but um, it doesn't worry me. Mm. And is that quite a political process, though, the means by which some things get taken to be fact or agreements? Yeah. And do you think that there should be sort of a more equal process by which agreements or facts are made? Well, the process has changed from one community to another. Um, so, uh, you've got to judge it a collective at a time. Um, some collectives are far more egalitarian and some are <clears throat> extraordinarily hierarchical. <laughs> um, traditionally, science, of course, has tried to operate like a, a group of peers. Um, and that was not a bad idea at the time. <laughs> um, in 2017, a hedge fund manager financed a, a massive experiment to see whether gravity waves existed, and the whole scientific collective got to work around that. And uh, they figure they've shown that gravity w waves exist now. Um, so. My finance is in there big time at the moment. Um, and so where has this work taken you recently? What sort of research or where are your, is your focus at the moment? Um, well, my career stopped uh, a little time ago. Um, and it, it had kind of come full circle. Uh, you'll see I'm doing two singing me bobs. Um, when I started my career, I, um, I, got, I got a job looking at the natural scientists, and I used a lot of work from anthropologists and philosophers and whatever to try and make sense of what was going on in science. And the science I was particularly interested in at that time, for purely accidental reasons, was genetics. And people were wandering around saying, well, you know, how wonderful Mendelism was and the truth had been discovered and this and that and the other. And um, at the very end of my career, I helped in direction of the work of a genomics center, looking at the sociology of the genomics, if you like. Um, and if you read a genomics textbook today and realize it's the inheritance of the science I looked at uh, 40, more than 40 years ago, uh, you, you see there aren't many facts left, for, <laughs> or at least if, if there are any left, they're in chapter 28 instead of in chapter 21. And the, the field has changed out of all recognition. And um, you know, somebody like me, you can't help but think there's a half-life to be <laughs> identified there. And um, but that's why I, I've um, <clears throat> done work in two areas, because the work on sex was the stuff that came round full circle and ended. Um, but the work on facts um, was to do with doing an awful lot of work on science before, and then deciding what well, I've learned a lot about it. You know, I'm like an anthropologist with a tribe and I thought to myself, well, at this point, I'll pay the debt back and try and use the science to explain other things going on in the social sciences and um, 
uh, and evening arts areas. And so I, I had a big swing of career from facts, <laughs> if you want to put it that way, um, to, um, <clears throat> or lack of facts uh, in science, to looking at sociology, how it understood the world, and how the tribes that it was studying looked at the world. And I was doing general sociology for about a decade or so. And then I went back to doing the research direction of the genomics center again. So I've got these two strings uh, to talk about. And I've got so many years behind me, you know, plenty of years on both of them. So uh, I, I can hope to tell people interesting things about both, just conceivably. We'll see whether I can manage that, I don't know. So does that mean that you don't think genomics has much to offer? Economics? Genomics. Oh, genomics. Yeah. Oh, I think genomics loads to offer. And I think we know um, an immense, we've got a much more sophisticated view of um, genetics than the old classical genetics had. Not their fault, of course, they hadn't got the technology. Um, but with the developments over the years, genetics has been transformed. And um, <clears throat> if, if you go through it very slowly, it doesn't necessarily feel like it every five minutes. But again, it's these little wobbles in meaning all add up over time. And then you get sudden shifts in the strata, you know, like you get an earthquake after a lot of pressure underground. And then a lot of toddling along again, a bit of a shift again. You look at that over 40 years, it's quite amazing where you've got to. And uh, same thing's happened in the world, of course. The, uh, everybody talks about gender these days. It's really very politically correct to talk about most things as sex. Um, so. And you've done some work on identifying the, the number of sexes that you think could exist. This is true. Well, <laughs> um, what does one? Uh, I, I've given it a lot of thought. <laughs> yes. Do you have an answer? <laughs> I'm sorry? Do you have an answer to... How many sexes are there? How many there? sexes there are, How many yeah. do you fancy? <laughs> you think there could be an endless amount of numbers? Well, I think with current knowledge, we could do quite a good job of knocking up a few if we wanted to. Um, and... <clears throat> Of course, you've also got to remember there are two ends to which you can change things. We could probably knock up a few more by using modern biotechnology. Um, and in fact, they have. Um, you know, all the stuff about um, uh, re three parents these days. Um, you imagine biotechnology continuing to chug away with that. Uh, but that, of course, is... is um, developed now, there are examples where um, the genetic parents of a child can be identified as, as three, as three if, you, if you're in the mind to do that. And think of um, uh, the, the more routine bits of DNA as coming from a third parent. Um, but then it's up to us, isn't it? <laughs> it's... it's um, the world doesn't, the one thing the world do, doesn't do is speak of us, uh, speak to us in any language at all. Um, uh, it can't speak to us, it just sits there and waits for us to notice things about it and to develop technologies. And we, we, we actually steal the world um, ourselves to make technologies out of. I mean, particularly in biology these days, viruses are now technologies in. Um, genomics and their, their delivery systems for genetic information you want to stick into an organism somewhere and they do wonderful things with viruses having killed us off for millennia they're now helping us along right? so, um, so you've got to bring, bear in mind the future is very bound up with it with technology and um, and that's partly us and partly out there, if you want to put it that way. I don't know what the answer is in words. Uh, sorry, I'm very bad on words. I'm no, sorry. lovely. I mean, words are not reliable, as we've learned. 
Uh, they're not. They're no, not. That's right. that's Thank right. you very much. Thank it's you lovely. for interviewing me. <laughs> for podcasts, talks, debates, courses and articles, visit the Institute of Art and Ideas. Click the link on screen now to iai.tv.